Welcome to Protagonist Pub. My name is Tammy, and this is where characters gather. I'm a small town man. She said we got a hard job. Sweet red wine made from the biggest watermelons. On. It is Monday, y'all, and uh, it is not going to be a stormy week this week, in theory. So, that is looking up. And, uh, uh, surprisingly, had a very good weeding rake. Weeding, weed, weeding. Why can't I talk? Apparently I need more than one cup of coffee. Um, had you asked me Wednesday or Thursday of last week how my weeding was going, I would have told you that, uh, it was a very bad week. And I was wondering come Thursday, what I was actually going to sit down and talk about today. Yeah, that concern was unfounded on my part. Apparently a trip to the library was a very good thing. And I have plenty to talk about. So without further ado, let's talk about the DNFs for the week. And there were three. So first up would be a soft DNF from last summer. That would be Debbie Mason summer at Honeysuckle Ridge. And despite the very sweet cover, um, this is now a hard DNF. Uh, Characters were annoying to begin with, which was beginning to set my teeth on edge. Um, our female protagonist is a 20-something self-absorbed, I could care less about any anybody else other than me and my own problems in the world sort of female. And our... Male protagonist is a army army vet. We'll say military vet. He's suffering some issues, but overall, he was a fairly decent guy. However, given the fact that I really dislike the female protagonist, I didn't like some of the. Uh, early internal character monologues both of them had and that they had about each other. And so I started flipping through and when I bought this book, it was described as sweet and small town romance. And so, you know, it, it, it fit my alley when I, bought it last year and flipping through, um, you know, sneaking pages to see what was going on. This quickly turns into a sweet small town romance that may or may not have characters that redeem themselves from the opening pages. And it turns into enough open door scenes that just on a casual flip through trying to figure out what was in the book it it wasn't worth my time investment so i can safely cross that off as a dnf i can probably safely cross debbie mason off my list for potential reads i know i have one other of hers on my kindle and uh it's probably just going to sit there for eternity so that's fine. Next up for the TNFs of the week was a Goodreads win. It released on the 4th of March from Dell. And that is Match Me If You Can by Swati Hedge. This is a contemporary romance set in Mumbai. I DNF, DNF this on page two. Um, when the... Um, nonsense language started 
And, um, yeah, I, uh, do not care to read anything that uses such nonsense language words such as cis or identifies straight women as something to be scorned. So that was an instant DNF. Don't feel bad about it. You can go to the library and somebody will go pay 50 cents for it and probably promptly return it as well. So I'm good with that. Editing Tammy. There was one more DNF this week. That was, <sighs> I heard a fly buzz before I died. Titled right here by Amanda Flower. It is the second Emily Dickinson book. As you know, I reviewed it last week. I enjoyed the first one in the series. I am done. I So the second book opens up and begins to heavily lean into the current speculation about the relationship between Emily and her sister-in-law, Susan. And while that speculation amongst modern day scholars was hinted at in the first book, it is much more blatant in the second book. And, you know, I don't care. I do not care what a bunch of scholars today think about the relationship between two women in pre-Civil War America. I do not care. It has zero impact on the collected works of Emily Dickinson. It is academic gossip to further careers in my opinion and whether or not that said speculation is justified has a grain of truth to it or is just you know titillation to sell academic books is neither here nor there they are dead they cannot speak for themselves. Emily left beautiful poetry and that should be enough. And I am not going to indulge an author who is, you know, tacitly, overtly tacitly giving in to said speculation. I'm just not, it's just, I'm done. I'm tapping out. Enjoyed the first book, but no, nope, I'm done. So, okay, back to the video. And last up was a library book. Went to the library on Friday afternoon. And oh, did I, do I have a very impressive library hall. It is all over the place and it was it's wonderful and I'm enjoying it as you will see when I talk about books I've read this week. Um, but that is Still Life by Louise Penny. This is the first book in the Inspector Gamache series. It is a police procedural mystery. It is set in the Montreal province of Canada. And I think it was earlier this year, I watched the Amazon Prime series of Inspector Gamache. It was based on this book. That series was full of anti-Catholic bigotry and hatred and lies and prejudice that they perp perp perpetrated in, in the video series. But I wanted to read the book to see if it was better, different, less hateful. Um, I got a couple of chapters in before I decided to DNF it. A, the story is very familiar. 
B, the dialogue is very familiar. I swear some of the opening dialogues they took word for word and put into the series, which is fine. That's fine. But along with that is the anti-Catholic threads, the openly burnful of anyone who doesn't agree with some of the agendas in the book. So, you know what? I, I've just watched the series that, you know, was distasteful. I'm not going to read what I know is going to be equally as distasteful of read. So, that's DNF. Louise Penny is off my list, and I'm okay with that. And, you know, thankfully, I got it from the library, and it didn't cost me a penny. Okay, so what did I read this week? I read a book on Kindle. I read a classic. I read two library books. I have a third library book that's halfway through, and I had to talk myself into setting it down long enough to film this video. And I already can promise you I'm going to <laughs> read that book in between editing this video and uploading it. So if it's a little later than normal, you understand why I will be finishing a book. So first up, let's talk about the classic I read this week. I read Frankenstein, the 1818 text by Mary Shelley. And of this work, which is comes in at 257 pages, I only read the text of Frankenstein. And I am okay with that. Um... So Frankenstein itself is a little over 200 pages, like let's say 230 pages. So it's not huge. I'm, I'm good with that. So it is, now I'm curious. Frankenstein itself is 216 pages. So it's not huge in this version of the text. Um, did I enjoy it? I didn't not like it. At the same time, I don't know that I could sit here and say honestly that I enjoyed it. There were a couple of quotes that I love, like this one. Learn from me, if not by my precepts, at least by my example. How dangerous is the acquirement of knowledge, and how much happier that man is who believes his native town to be the world than he who aspires to become greater than his nature will allow. I mean, there were some very on-point quotes, but at the same time, Frankenstein is a very weak and flawed character who never has a moment of honest self-reflection and never truly takes responsibility for his own actions. And when he eventually decides that he's not going to do what he agreed to do for the monster. And he refuses to build Mrs. Monster. That is the first moment he honestly goes, you know what? Uh, maybe this is a bad idea. I was incredibly frustrated with just how 
pathetic a character Frankenstein is. His younger brother dies. He knows who is responsible for that. The family maid is executed for his younger brother's death, and he knows she didn't do it, but he doesn't speak up to preserve his own skin. <sighs> then his best friend dies. And, and still, uh, I understand why Sister Rosemary never had this on any of our literature courses. They, she would have been so irritated with this book, she could not have taught it effectively. And B, I don't think any of us, A, would have enjoyed it, and B, would have had any sympathy whatsoever for Frankenstein. And that would have frustrated her. I know we are all weak and sinful and want to preserve our own life, but at what cost? And then what does it cost Frankenstein? It costs him everything. And it was, it was just frustrating. Will I unhaul it? No. Am I glad I read it? Yes. Am I looking forward to the um, pictures right here? Kindle book I have that is about the women in the Frankenstein household. Yes. But overall, it was just a uh, novel. And it took me days to read 216 pages. I'm not lying. It took me, it took me days. It probably took me three days to read Frankenstein. And I can normally read 216 pages. No problem, but no. No, not this time. This time it was a problem because it was just frustrating. I wanted to slap Victor Frankenstein and just go, you pathetic little child. Man child at that. So that was Frankenstein. And when I finished Frankenstein, um, I, I needed something to cleanse my palate and nothing on my TBR was working to do that and nothing on my shelves sounded appealing. So I went to Kindle Unlimited and I, on a whim, downloaded The Earl Next Door by Ashlyn Newton Noble. Her name's right here on the cover. And this was a... Regency rom-com and I absolutely loved this. No, seriously, this was fantastic. I am looking forward to reading the rest of the series. It was sweet. It was clean. It was well-written. It had fleshed out characters. It tells the story of a oh wow well, wait i have to look so in this one our female protagonist is in london for what is probably her final season because she is trying to make a match and her sister is funding her season and her funds are running out so it is important that she makes a match and as the book opens up, our heroine, whose name I cannot recall, it's right here, um, is playing croquet with other members of the town, and she notices that the uh, young dude about to take his turn has a rip in his breeches in the rear end, and she tries to subtly tell him it blows up, it gets in the gossip papers, and her incredibly rigid sister and unwilling to, you know, bear any kind of scandal immediately decides they need to flee to Bath the remainder of the season, and if they're lucky, they will make a match in Bath. So they flee to Bath, they rent a townhouse, and the they have her 
They have plans for the uh, immediately adjacent townhouse. The man her sister is interested. Her sister is a widow, by the way. Brents it. And some upstart Earl comes along, offers higher rent, gets the townhouse, and thus begins our story. And this is a delightful, just it, it was a delightful series of twists and turns and banters and trying to get people married off without being so obvious about it. At the same time, it has chemistry, it's swoon-worthy, it's funny, and as the book concludes, you're like, I need more, and luckily there's more books out, and then a new book releases in July, I think it's the third book in the series, so yes, I will definitely be continuing this series, it was a wonderful find, I love the cover, I love the fact that we had heroine who absolutely was confident in who she was and understood her own squabbles in life and had no qualms about sticking up for herself, sticking up for her, her sister, trying to do the right thing no matter the cost. And it turns out that's exactly what the Earl is trying to do too. So this one I highly recommend. It was it was fantastic. And I loved that it wasn't set in London. I loved that it took place in Bath and that it wasn't all balls and you know that high society stuff. It was don't get me wrong, it's still very much high society. This isn't a a, a commoner's tale at all, but it's a little less glitter and a, a lot more approachable type of story. So I loved this one. This is an easy, easy recommendation. Okay. So the next two books are from the library. And one was a Regency era and one was sci-fi. So I'm going to break up the Regencies and I'm going to talk about sci-fi next. My library had a copy of Mr. Penumbra's 24-Hour Bookstore by Robin Sloan. And I've wanted to read this for a long time. It was on the shelf. I was in the mood. Picked it up. Y'all, I thoroughly enjoyed this. Is it going to age well through, you know, the next 50 years? No, no, it's probably not. Did that take away from my overall enjoyment of the book? No, it absolutely did not. Our hero, our hero is Carl. He is set in an alternate universe that is very, very much like ours. Google still exists, Facebook, all, all this stuff in social media, you know, it's like this book was published in, 2012, I believe. Let's see. Yep, 2012. And it would be a familiar world in 2012. If you read this in 2012, you could see the world around you reflected in this book. So he goes, he's out of work, he gets laid off, and he stumbles across this job at the bookstore and it's a very odd job but you know it keeps him employed so he's you know pleased and soon he realizes that it's really an odd job like the bookstore isn't making enough money to pay the bills and all these odd characters come in and never buy books, but check them out. And he gets involved in this sci-fi mystery and Google gets involved and 
you go from San Francisco to New York to the deserts of Nevada. And it was very relatable. And it wasn't... It is not sci-fi set in space, first of all. Second of all, even though it's full of computer stuff and solving a complex code and the mystery, it's still very approachable. It isn't... Um, hard science by any means. And a lot of what they talk about is already outdated 12 years later, but it's still a very, very good story. I enjoyed it immensely. Didn't move me to tears. It made me laugh at times. And it's an easy sci-fi read. It really is. It's an easy sci-fi read. It's not complex sci-fi. I would have no trouble recommending that to a teenager who enjoyed science fiction and saying, hey, go ahead. Yep. There are a couple of um, adult scenes between Carl and his girlfriend, but they're not spicy. They're not descriptive, but you do know what occurs between two adults. I will put that disclaimer in. And only because I said it's appropriate for teenagers. Which I still think it is. I would have read it as a teenager and my parents wouldn't have had a problem with it. So. Okay. Last up was a library book that I had been wanting to read for a while. It was published in 2009. That is Mr. Malcolm's List by Suzanne Elaine, Allen. Elaine. I do not like this cover. I much prefer this cover because it matches the second book I picked up by the same author, um, which is downstairs in my library hall. And I don't think this cover relates well to the contents of the book. It does, however, match the movie cast, so that's why it's there. You know those books that are just frustrating and irritating to read, but you can't put them down? It's not long. It's 244 pages. Had it been much longer than that, I, I would have DNF'd it. And not because I hated it, but because it was so irritating <sighs> just <sighs> the the premise is is that the second son of an earl who is incredibly wealthy is the single most sought after man that every woman is trying to catch and he has a list and one offended female in the book does not realize it's their said list. He takes her to the opera and doesn't call on her again. And she is so outrageously offended by this that she sticks her cousin on him to try to figure out why. And her cousin learns about said list. And then she decides to exact revenge. Okay, that, that, you know, it's petty. It's understandable at the same time. And the offended woman, her name is, is Julia. And as the book develops, Julia comes up with this scheme. She invites her quote unquote friend from finishing school, Sadie, who she hasn't seen in five years to come and stay with her for a couple of months. And she tries to rope Sadie into the revenge plan by throwing her at Mr. Malcolm. Sadie 
doesn't agree to the revenge plan, but neither does she state that she is opposed. So while it's nice that Julia thinks she's standing up for herself and she's a very assertive character, Sadie is assertive in her own right, but a much more reserved form of that. And Julia is just so annoying, like petty and never takes responsibility for her own actions. And she is never willing to look at a situation and go, Oh, Hey, you know what? I overreacted. Wasn't a big deal. It was just irritating. And yet I kept reading because it was at the same time, this incredibly engaging story. And I, I still don't know where I, I, I land on this book. Do I, do I love it? No. Did I hate it? No. Would I recommend it? I don't know, to be honest. It wasn't horrible. It wasn't great. It wasn't overly memorable. It was just... <sighs> yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm hoping the other book is better. If the other book is not better, and if I'm not, you know, truly invested by page 50... I will DNF the second book. That's it's not a series, but the second book I have by the author and not, you know, do this to myself. So that is everything I finished last week. So what am I currently reading? Well, I am currently reading. I'm still reading the first book in the Stormlight Archive, Way of Kings. I'm about halfway through. I know I said I was going to finish it last week. I did not. Probably this week. I, you know, read some more last night and I'm completely invested. So I need to sit down and do that. I started a Substitute Dave book. Didn't get very far. That is The Magic Engineer by Ellie Modesty Jr. It's book three in the Saga Recluse series. This is just a matter of me curling up and, and reading. I'm invested already, but I just wasn't in the mood for it. I did start um, my buddy read with Amanda late yesterday afternoon. That is Pull Dark by... Winston Graham. This is the first book in the Poldark series. Um, I know that's the star from the miniseries. I would prefer not to have him on the cover, but good luck finding a copy of the book without him on the cover or any of the stars on their books. Um, I'm on chapter four. Let me see. I'm at chapter three. And I am invested, however, and I hope this character does not appear a lot in the book because if she does, I am going to pull out all my hair. There's a character in the book that has a lisp and she is written having the lisp. Instead of just telling the character or the reader that she speaks with a lisp, it is actually written that way. And it is disconcerting. To be honest, it is a disconcerting. Takes you completely out of the story as you're trying to figure out what's going on in the conversation. Not enjoying that part. So two chapters in, I am more than happy to keep reading. So we shall see. And what am I reading that I almost put off recording this video for? Library book. 
That is The Summer We Started Over by Nancy Thayer. This is definitely a beach read. It is under 300, it's right at 300 pages. 302 pages. I am halfway through. I will finish this today. I love the cover. It takes place on Nantucket. It is a family drama. It is a romance. I will read you a little bit of the inside flap. Eddie Grant is happy with her life and her work as a personal assistant to Diana Lavender, one of the most famous and renowned romance authors in the business. But being a spectator to notoriety and clamor isn't as fulfilling as she once thought. Thankfully, Eddie has the perfect excuse for vacation. Her hardworking younger sister, Barrett, is opening her gift shop on Memorial Day weekend and could use all the help she could get. But going home to, beautiful Nantuck to the beautiful island of Nantucket means facing the family's difficult past. This is clean. It is swoony. It is full of family secrets and romance and atmosphere and I, I I love this book. I will finish this book undoubtedly before this video is released today, but it, the chapters are short. So if you're picking it up between doing other things, it's easy to pick up, read a couple chapters, stop, go do whatever you're doing and come back to it characters are approachable just it's perfectly lovely it is a perfectly lovely summer read and I, I want to read more by her I don't think I have ever read anything by her in my life and she I know she has an extensive ba backlist yeah she has an extensive backlist most of them take place on Nantucket and um I will be reading them. I just, I will be reading them. So that is what I read last week. What I am reading. So, um, what am I planning to read other than what I already mentioned? I don't know, but we'll timestamp this video. And up next would be the books from my library hall. So if you're interested in the possibilities, stay tuned. If not, please leave a comment down below, like, and subscribe. And I will see you here next time at the Protagonist Pub. Okay. Who is excited for Library Hall? I'm always excited for Library Hall. And um, you're going to notice these are... If they came upstairs the way they were downstairs, there is some order to them, but they're not in any particular order. Like, so let's talk about Christmas in July books. I picked up an Ann Perry Christmas in July book. You will notice that not this particular one, but in the video that's coming out on Wednesday, there is an Ann Perry Christmas book in there. And they are all about this length. They are short. They're like a little bit taller than a mass market paperback. And these are all just easy, sweet, fantastic, atmospheric, winter, Christmassy reads that are clean and usually set in the Victorian era. And I, I love them. I, I honestly love them. So she, when she was alive, she put one out every year. She died this year or late last year. This one was published in 2018. And this is just a list of her Christmas novels. It's by no means her backlist. And yeah, this is an easy, easy, easy recommendation for all ages. Next up is a Denise Hunter book. And this did not, this almost made the July poll choice. And I forgot to mention it in the video that's coming out on Wednesday. But you're going to sneak peek of what 
should have been in that video. That is Falling Like Snowflakes by Denise Hunter. This is the first book in the Summer Harbor series. And it is set in Rural Maine. So, one of my favorite locations in the universe. And, yeah, it's probably you're going to see this on my July TBR. A book I know is in the video on Wednesday is In the Bleak Bit Midwinter by Julia Spencer Fleming. This is the first book in the Claire Ferguson Russ Van Alston novel series. I have not read anything by her. I am very much looking forward to this. I know this is a long running series. It's a mystery. It's just over 300 pages. And again, you're not going to be surprised that I read this. Next up is the new Mary Kay Andrews Christmas book. That is Bright Lights Big Christmas. And uh, I am very, very, very here for this. This one was published in 2023. So, it was last year's book. But my library just got it. I'm reading it. I, I love her Christmas. I love everything she writes, to be honest. But I love her Christmas books. They're much shorter than her other books. They're all Christmassy without being Christmassy. They're clean. They're fun. They're enjoyable. I love these books. And an impulse pickup when I walked into the library to pick up all my books on hold and to, you know, wander the shelves and pull books I had on a list. Because obviously I didn't have enough waiting for me on hold. That is The Book Club Hotel by Sarah Morgan. Okay. Look at the cover. It just screams winter. I have not read anything by this author. I will read you a little bit of the front flap. Nestled in rural Vermont's snowy landscape is Maple Sugar Inn, the boutique hotel Hattie Coleman and her husband Brent lovingly restored. But when Brent died a month after the opening, it was left to Hattie to carry on alone. With its historic charm and picture-perfect library, it's considered the winter destination. And as the holidays approach, the inn is fully booked with guests looking for their dream vacation. But widowed, far too young, and exhausted from juggling the hotel while being a dedicated single mom, Hattie dreams only of making it through the festive season. Again. Words are not necessary. <laughs> okay. Next up would be some mystery choices. Another first in the series. Author I don't know. But I love the title. And I enjoy the cover. That is The Case of the Donnie Dowager. By Kathy Ace. It's a slim little volume. It is under... 300 pages? 213 pages. So this is going to be a very quick read for me. We will know very quickly if I'm going to read this and enjoy it and continue on. I know there are probably 8 to 10 more books in the series. And I... Yeah. I need to find out. Next up is the third book in the Electra McDonald series. That is Playing It Safe by Ashley Weaver. I'm a little behind on this series. This is the, the most latest and the only one I haven't read. So I just need to sit down and read it. This is World War II mystery set during the um, Blitz on London. And... They're espionage. They're slightly romantic. I'm enjoying the series immensely. So that is an easy, safe choice for me. Next up is a new to me author. And 
While the cover is not compelling, what I read about it was, and this one is set in Ireland, that is Christine Falls by Benjamin Black. And I will read you the blurb. In the debut crime novel from Booker Award winner John Banville, a Dublin pathologist follows a corpse of a mysterious woman into the heart of a conspiracy among the city's high Catholic society. I... I need to read this. I, I need to read this. I haven't read anything by John Banville, and Benjamin Black is his pen name, so... It's going to be an Irish police procedural, undoubtedly. It's 340 pages. And the thing I love about library books, especially in comparison to current printed hardbacks for the public, is the quality of the pages. They are thick. They have tactile grip to them. They are not flimsy and likely to, you know hair if you, you know, flip them too quickly or your fingernail catches the edge of one. That is a great benefit to picking up a library book, among many other great benefits, versus, you know, buying the book. Next up are some summer reads. Um, let's see. First up would be uh, Summer by the Sea by Susan Wiggs. This one sounds fabulous. With a little determination and a lot of charm, Rosa Capelletti took a rundown pizza joint and turned it into an award-winning restaurant that has been voted best place to propose three years in a row. For Rosa, though, there has been no real romance since her love affair with Alexander Montgomery ended without explanation a decade ago. But guess who's just come back into town? Yeah. I need to read this. I need, I need to know. I need to know all of the things. Okay, next up is Evie Drake Starts Over by Linda Holmes. I want to read this. It is set in Maine as well. Yep, in a sleepy seaside town in Maine. Recently winnowed Eveleth Evie Drake rarely leaves her large painfully empty house nearly a year after her husband's death in a car crash. Everyone in town, even her best friend Andy, thinks grief keeps her locked inside and Evie doesn't correct them. I am interested but I just caught the blurb as I was reading that passage to you and now I'm a little leery. From the host of NPR's Pop Culture Happy Hour podcast. Mm. Comes a heartfelt debut about the unlikely relationship between a young woman who lost her husband and a major league pitcher who's lost his game. So, Maine, baseball, undoubtedly, you know, a little more mature protagonist. But... Uh, the NPR thing has me leery, which is very sad, but that is the truth. So we shall see on that one. We shall see. Because she has a second novel, which I'm equally interested in, but again, the NPR thing. Next up is probably one of the th books I'm going to read this week. That is The Summer of Sunshine and Margot by Susan Mallory. And this is, again, another beach read. Mallory writes a lot of beach reads, and this one is 355 pages. So I will read you the, a little bit. The Baxter sisters have only ever had one another until one fateful summer when Sunshine and Margot turned disastrous luck into destiny. I love the cover. Just, I love the cover. And uh, I have to know. I love the fact that they're reading. They're both reading on the cover. Just, it's a Tammy book. It is a Tammy book. Okay. 
Now we hit the Regency section, and I, hold on to your hats, checked out a, a nonfiction. Yeah, I know. You're all shocked. So next up is the other Susan Allen book I told you about. That is Miss Lattimore's Letter. Again, I like this cover so much better. And this was published in 2021. So there is quite a bit of time between those two books. And those are her only titles. So she takes her time between books. I will read you the back of this one. So Feronia Lattimore had her romantic dreams destroyed years ago and is resigned to her role as a chaperone for her cousin. Still, she cannot sit idly by when she becomes aware that a gentleman is about to propose to the wrong woman. She sends him an anonymous letter that is soon the talk of the town, particularly when her advice proves to be correct. Her identity is discovered and Sophie, formerly a wallflower, becomes sought after for her quote-unquote expert matchmaking skills. One person who seeks her out is the eligible and attractive Sir Edmund Winslow. As Sophie assists Sir Edmund in pursuit of a wife, she wishes she could, be, she could recommend herself as his bride. However, she vows to remain uninvolved while aiding him in his search, especially since the gentleman surely does not return her affection. But when her long-lost love and Sir Edmund both seem to be interested in courting her, Sophie can't figure out if she's headed for another broken heart or for the altar. How can she be expected to help other people sort out their romantic lives when her own is such a disaster? This sounds like something I would enjoy. It sounds, you know sassy and assertive and strong and funny and <sighs> I'm just leery after Mr. Malcolm's list. So I've promised myself that if by page 50 I am still, you know, rolling my eyes and frustrated with our heroine, I'm putting it aside. So this is a time will tell. Next are two choices for Jane Austen July. Um, I'm not sure what I'm doing specifically for Jane Austen July, if anything. So first up is a Austen adjacent novel that is Longborn by Joe Baker. And this tells the other half of Pride and Prejudice. And it tells it from the viewpoint of the servants of the household. And I think this sounds so up my alley. So if I'm in the mood, I will read it. It's going to make it onto my um, July pile. But you know, as we all know, I've been mood reading a lot lately. So we will determine if I'm in the mood for that. Okay, time for the unexpected nonfiction pick. That is Jane Austen's Best Friend by Zoe Whedon. Yep, Whedon. And this is The Life and Influence of Martha Lloyd. This is a very short book. Counting the bibliography and the index, it is 208 pages, and the text itself is 186 pages, and there are pictures in the center. I will read you the description. All fans of Jane Austen everywhere believe themselves to be best friends with the beloved author, and this book sheds a light on what it meant to be actually that. Jane Austen's best friend, the life and influence of Martha Lloyd, offers unique insight into Jane's private inner circle. 
Through this heartwarming examination of an important and often overlooked person in Jane's world, we uncover the life-changing force of their friendship. Each chapter details the fascinating facts and friendship forming qualities that tied Jane and Martha together. Within these pages, we will relive their shared interests, the hits and misses of their romantic love lives, their passion for shopping and fashion, their family histories, their lucky breaks, and their girly chats. This book offers a behind-the-scenes tour of the shared lives of a fascinating pair and the chance to deepen our own bonds in love and friendship with them both. I really want to read this. I... We all know I don't read nonfiction a lot, but it's a perfect choice for Jane Austen July. It's not very thick, but it sounds very engaging. So, that are the current books I have checked out of the library. I have one currently on hold, which I will pick up later this week, and hopefully something else comes off hold, or goes on hold for me or it comes in stock and I will have several books to return by then it's all good however when I was at the library this week I um, got roped into the summer reading challenge for the library and I am going to Here's, uh, let's see if I can do this. Here's the board. I'm not trying to flip anybody off. Um, I can easily do this board. So it starts, the starting point on the board is visit a local park or museum. And we have things like follow the library on social media, recommend a book for an adventure book list, attend a library event, submit a song for the library's international music playlist, submit a book review, uh, go on a hike. So it's geared towards families. It's very family friendly. It's very reader friendly. And one of the rules, um, for the summer reading challenge for our library is adults rather just read complete any activity by reading for an hour okay so um raffle tickets are or raffle tickets due by the 8th of august and we have some great prizes you can earn more tickets by completing more boards so you can win the Lego Harry Potter Hogwarts Castle set, a Around the World book bundle, a collapsing camping wagon with folding tabletop, a 4K waterproof action camera, a Coleman four-person tent and hydration backpack, a camping package, which is a set of two lounge chairs, camping stove, percolator, coffee pot with mugs, or a river package, waterproof speaker, four river tubes, and a waterproof foam pouch. You get to choose one of those if you're if if, if a raffle prize comes up. And so there are seven prizes. Our library does a great job, and it uh, lists all the events for adults on the back. There, yeah, I'm gonna participate. And I think I'm going to do a vlog of the summer reading challenge. See if I can mix the board up and, and complete stuff for that. So, do you have a vlog to look forward to? Don't know when it's going to come out, but there you go. Okay. So, that is the current library haul. Minus the books I talked about that I read last week and what I'm currently reading. So you are all caught up to date. I hope you enjoyed this video. I realize it was a little long and I, uh, there are probably three, quite possibly four videos coming out this two, including this one this week. Uh, 
there's just a plethora of stuff that's backlogged and it needs to come out before July. So, yeah. Okay. We're all cut up. Leave a comment down below, like, and subscribe. And I will see you here next time at the Protagonist Pub.